In this video, we will explore the concept of systems thinking or the systems view of life as expressed by the physicist, ecologist, and teacher, Fritjof Kopper. Now, I have a very comprehensive resource on this uh, in my happiness encyclopedia that you can find down below. But in this video, I'll explain what is the systems view or systems thinking, how does this apply to happiness, and then how does this apply to several other disciplines or topics, things like understanding life and mind, understanding social systems and societies, and then how to kind of save the world and some of the big problems of today. So let's get into it. Now, what is systems thinking or the systems view? And I would say it's really less of a discipline in itself and more of a way of engaging with each and every discipline, right? So it's not saying it's its own thing, but it's like the systems view or the systems way of thinking is something you can use to think about or think within economics or psychology, or business. And it's really about going from relation, or excuse me, going to uh, relationships, patterns, connectedness, and context. So I'll give some examples of this, right? We tend to, and especially in like the sciences, have kind of a reductionistic and mechanistic worldview. And this comes from a long history of Western science, but reductionistic means kind of oversimplifying things or looking at parts rather than holes. So here's an example of this that I find fascinating. So if you look at sugar, so sugar is composed of atoms of uh, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. And we all know sugar tastes sweet. Well, oxygen doesn't taste sweet. Carbon doesn't taste sweet. Hydrogen doesn't taste sweet sweetness actually emerges from those atoms in a certain structure interacting with a person's tongue. Now we'll think about mechanistic, right? So I said reductionistic. This tends to be the traditional worldview is uh, reductionistic and it's also mechanistic. So this is sort of like linear causation, like a machine. And another example of this is think about kicking a ball versus kicking a dog. I don't advocate that, but think about it. So you kick a ball, right? It's very mechanistic and linear. You kick it and it just goes off in that direction. If you kick a dog, on the other hand, that's a highly non-linear reaction because it's like, depends on the temperament of the dog, depends on maybe where you kick them and how that dog processes that information and recognizes you and responds. It's incredibly complex. So what we find is that often our ways of thinking, especially in our Western cultures, tend to be overly reductionistic, overly mechanistic, when the world in reality is often uh, complex systems where the whole is something other than the sum of the parts, and you have these uh, non-linear, more um, non-mechanistic kind of cause and effect relationships. You know, so you can think about this and, and thinking about this kind of systems view, right? It's something that goes across the various dimensions of, you know, the organism and the individual has these biological and neurological systems. And then you have uh, groups or teams or organizations in these social systems up to the level of society and economies, and then even the ecosystem as a whole. And so I'll share one more model of kind of that captures the, the idea of the systems view and an important part of the systems view, which is something called an emergent property. And this also relates to happiness. So an emergent property, so think about, you know, I gave the example uh, just before of uh, kicking a ball versus a dog, right? Uh, and I gave the example of sweetness emerging from sugar based on the pattern and the relationship of the atoms. So imagine you just have a big pile of stuff. You got handlebars, you got a frame, you got a seat, you got some metal, you got a couple chains, you got some rubber tubes, you got some spokes, you got some cables. It's all just right there in a big pile. Now, would you call that a bicycle? Probably not. But when you take all of those same component parts, and arrange them in a certain pattern that forms an organized system, the property of bicycleness essentially emerges. Going back to that quote, that the whole is something more or something other than the sum of the parts. Right, so that right there, that's the system's view, is trying to see reality and engage with various disciplines this way. So what are these properties that emerge at the level of the system? And one example I would give of that is happiness. So in my model of happiness, which I share as well, you can find in uh, my resources with the learned happiness model, we say that it's not about just one thing, rather that when certain areas, critical factors of our lives are in harmony 
and in the right balance, happiness kind of emerges. So those are things like basic security and safety needs, healthy relationships and social connection. Then you have kind of uh, biological needs and factors uh, which determine your experience of happiness. And then you have maybe more cognitive and reflective factors, right? Things like you know, your mental health, your sense of meaning and purpose. It's not so much any one of those. When you have all of those in a certain balance, and importantly, that balance or how that looks may vary based on your personal context versus mine versus anyone else's. But when in your personal context, you have all of those key factors, right? Happiness emerges as something more than the sum of the parts because it's not just about my relationships. It's not just about getting exercise. It's not just about the work I'm doing, right? It's how all of these fit together to create something called your life. And happiness is that emergent property, sort of like the sweetness in the sugar. Again, it's kind of like trying to understand the human body. If you were to just cut off my hand and look at my hand in a laboratory and then, you know, cut off my leg and look at my leg in a laboratory and then maybe even, you know, take my brain out, put it in a vat, put it in the laboratory. You can have all those things and the best scientists in the world studying each one. But until you have them all together in this living system, you don't really have a Jackson because that emerges at the level of the system. So this again can apply to business, psychology, to anything. It's really a fundamental shift in how we see the world. And as I touched on there, I think it's a very useful perspective to understand the dimensions that lead to happiness, uh, both again on a slightly more granular level, as well as you know bigger picture. How do I think about my happiness and the happiness of others? So let's get into some applications. Where do life and mind come from? How did they get here? So I'll try to do a very uh, faster paced explanation here. And again, I have more depth and written out kind of background on this in the resource down below. But let's begin with life. So life can be thought of as any sort of self-regulating and self-generating system. So the basic building block being a cell. And well, what does a cell do at the simplest level? Well, it really exists as its own individual network where it has a cell membrane and all the stuff going on inside. It takes in raw materials in the form of energy. You know, it converts those things into its own components or its own parts that sustain the structural organization of the cell, but the inner parts are always changing and being recycled, et cetera. Right? And it does this to preserve itself and keep itself alive and functioning and keep the network uh, going. And then it produces some waste. So it's essentially, again, this self-generating little network. And we say self-generating and self-organizing in that you know it organizes itself, the structure of it, and it uses external energy to maintain itself and keep its reactions going for as long as it can. So what we see is there's a connection here between the kind of the basic living system and non-living systems and chemical reactions in that some reactions just spontaneously emerge into higher levels of complexity. This is a principle known as emergence or self-organizing or bifurcation. And what it means is that even if you have totally like inorganic non-living materials and chemicals, energy can be flowing through it. In some cases, they will spontaneously emerge into higher levels of complexity. And a great example of this is if you put soap in water and shake it up, by shaking it, you're adding uh, mechanical energy. And it spontaneously emerges into more complex kind of higher order structures with the, the soap bubbles. And so he draws out a connection that I won't go too in depth with here, but saying that it's likely that these sort of spontaneous kind of this inherent creative principle in the universe, and I'm, that can be interpreted as God or not, but there's something in the universe where in certain cases, as you increase energy in a chemical reaction, novelty and complexity spontaneously emerge. And what you see is that that likely was that missing link where you have those increasingly complex things emerging and you start to get these um, self-regulating feedback loops that keep themselves going that become these self-generating networks that set the foundation up for cells. So you see that life could have emerged likely through these sort of spontaneous emergence of higher and higher levels of order and complexity until you get these self-generating networks known as cells, and then of course those become more complex cells, and then those cells become uh, tissue systems or organ systems, and then you have you know these animals and plants, and now everything starts to emerge. Uh, but all of these are these small self-generating systems nesting in larger and larger levels of systems. Kind of interesting. Well then how does mind come about in all of this? 
Well, uh, the System 2 of Life and Copper, he, ref he references uh, the Santiago theory of cognition, which sort of views mind as inherent in life itself. And it's saying that as one of these self-organizing or self-generating systems interacts with its environment, the system specifies which external factors are going to influence it. So I mean, a simple example of that is that a plant doesn't have ears, so sound is not gonna really affect the plant so much, right? So in a sense, the organism, right, is specifying which external factors it's going to care about. In the same sense that as a human being, I can focus my vision on one set thing where I can kind of take in everything. I am specifying which external information I'm going to process and react to. So just in that sense alone, you have the ability to discern or to choose almost, whether like a person, it's a very conscious process of I'm gonna look here, I'm gonna look out there. In a plant, it's not as conscious in the way we think about it, but it's still determining or uh, discerning which factors it's going to let influence it. Then further, what happens is that those reactions with this system or organism and its external environment will shape the reactions of that organism in the future. A much more simple example, maybe we use a plant again. So let's say a plant grow, you know, can sense where the sun is and it kind of grows a little bit in that direction. It gets more sun in its leaves. So there's more energy that comes into the system, right? It, the plant sort of recognizes that. Again, it's hard not to use human concepts here to talk about the plant, but it recognizes that. It continues to grow towards it. It continues to grow towards it. And so that's that heliocentricity is the technical term of plants moving towards the sun. So what we have is an expanded view of what it means to be conscious or have mind. And that as any of these self-regulating, self-generating living systems interact with an external environment, there's almost a dance right there where they're co-creating consciousness because that system has to take in information from that outside world, right? Which is in itself kind of perception and then make decisions to regulate itself and sustain itself in relation to that external system. So whether it's a little bacteria in there that you know you say, hey bacteria, hey, uh, get away from me, run away. It doesn't listen because it doesn't have hearing, it doesn't have ears. But if you put something maybe uh, a lighter near it and the bacteria can sense that heat and move away from it, right? That right there is an act of knowing or an act of cognition. Granted, it's not necessarily the same as someone holding up a flamethrower to me and me running away and being like, why is this person doing that? But it can still be thought of as knowing. So mind or consciousness can emerge through a system interacting with its external environment and preserving itself against that external environment. So let's talk about social groups and social organizations. We talked about a fundamental pattern just now of these uh, self-generating networks like the cell, right? Where it sort of creates and sustains itself and creates a boundary around that uh, reaction or that network. Social systems can be viewed in the same way. And this comes from the work of Nicholas Luhmann, who's a German sociologist. And the way you think of it is in a biological system, you're taking in uh, raw materials and energy, right? And you're creating components of a cell or of a body of a whatever. Uh, and you're creating a physical boundary in the boundary of the body or the cell membrane. And you're carrying on that way. But in a social system, what the kind of internal reactions are, are communications. And these communications generate ideas and thoughts and beliefs, and they become kind of a self-reinforcing feedback loop until you get a shared system, right? A shared system of language, of beliefs, of cultural values, right? That's why I can reference some meme or you know, say some slang or something that's not proper English. And if you're watching this video, at least in the United States, you probably kind of understand what I mean. Whereas someone who even maybe if they were from a different country and they spoke some English, they might be like, uh, I don't really get what you're talking about. So what you see there is that these reactions within a system create kind of the, these, these reactions create the components of the system. And the system becomes defined by a cultural boundary and you have a cultural community, which again kind of follows the, the laws of uh, systems or these self-organizing systems. Uh, and you know, Copper talks about how you can also, uh, within this, look at how power emerges in systems. It can emerge through uh, kind of coercion, so threats of violence or threats of 
uh, penalties. It can move through or it can emerge through the use of incentives. And finally, it can emerge through, uh, you know, this kind of big, complex, self-regulating reaction of culture uh, saying, hey, this is the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and this power can manifest again through hierarchies as well as networks. So especially in our modern world, you have many networks nesting within these bigger networks. So you have, let's say, you know, Instagram, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you know, each of these is a network, but you also have informal networks of people who know people who know people. And what uh, Capra, and he referenced some other literature on this, suggests is that the new mechanism of power in the 21st century is the ability to create these networks, connect these networks to one another, and determine who can join the network and who is excluded from the network. And so you can imagine that with all the controversy with a platform like Twitter, where you know, you're banning certain people, you're cutting people off, you're set, filtering that information. The ability to influence these large complex networks within our bigger network of culture and society uh, is where power comes from. But so again, kind of interesting to see this underlying pattern of systems thinking uh, in terms of social systems where you know smaller and smaller groups, et cetera, nesting into this bigger system that ultimately regulates itself because it's like we're producing the ideas and cultural norms and language of our own culture, but then it gets defined as like this cultural boundary. Finally, a few thoughts on saving the world, which sounds a little dramatic, but if you look at like pretty much any legitimate scientist or researcher at this point who is not incentivized by private companies, they'll pretty much say that, yeah, climate change and global warming is becoming an uh, existential threat or an existential crisis, meaning it could end uh, all life on Earth or certainly life as we know it. And Copper points out that a lot of the big problems of our time, climate change, you know, environmental destruction, but also things like poverty, injustice, war, violence, drugs, are systemic in nature. So here's an example of that. Let's talk about, uh, let's, let's just do climate change as one example, and we'll focus on pollution in third world countries or less developed countries. Well, you can say, oh, they just need to stop polluting less. But there are uh, factors, when you think about global capitalism and the value of labor, which is the people in those countries tend to have a lower uh, earning power for their labor and so they tend to stay more impoverished and it's hard for those countries to get out of poverty because the World Bank and the IMF have uh, kind of given them these high interest loans given often by first world countries. And so you have sort of a cycle of poverty there. And then those people, it's been shown that uh, people in poverty actually have higher birth rates. And so they have more children, they have larger families, they end up needing more resources. And because they're economically disadvantaged, they consume and you know, dispose of those things in a way that's not so effective because you know, maybe I can say, I'm gonna pay for a monthly recycling service or something, or I'm gonna organize my trash and get rid of it, whereas they don't really have those means. And so he says the fundamental issue in our worldview now is kind of a crisis of perception, which is what I shared at the beginning of this video, that it tends to be seeing the world in terms of linear causation, this uh, mechanistic and reductionistic worldview where you look at little specific issues, you look at specific parts, and again, you see things as simple cause and effect rather than these big, complex, integrated problems and solutions. And there's two ways that show up. One is, like I said, non-systemic solutions. So you can maybe think about something like uh, climate change and the example I gave of, oh, we're gonna ask China and India to pollute less. We're gonna tell them, hey, you need to pollute less. That is a very not nuanced systemic solution because you're just focusing on the component of CO2 emissions in India. But you need to think, well, what are the economic and social factors that lead to people in India having higher levels of poverty? And then so they're using things like uh, coal and wood burning at their homes to heat their homes. So we get a lot of these very piecemeal small solutions that probably aren't gonna address the bigger issue. The second thing we see coming up is this infinite growth fallacy. Uh, something Capra speaks to a lot, which is that the fundamental underpinnings of our economics and our theories are pretty much infinite growth on a finite planet. I'll say it again, infinite growth on a finite planet. Our basic functioning of our entire economy and financial market depends upon GDP growing slightly every year. But that's kind of impossible, right? Because the planet is finite and we have finite resources. So in this linear model, right, where you have value chains that are like, you know, you take raw materials, you turn them into components, then you turn them into finished goods, and then you take them to a retailer, package them, sell them to people, people use them for a little bit, throw away the packaging, then throw away the project, it goes to a landfill. 
again, what do you have there? Is that linear perception of basically just one in, one out, you create something, you use it, throw it away. Then you have, you know, infinite growth. We need to produce more every year. We need to keep expanding. We need to keep growing. And what this leads to is overconsumption, right? Waste, pollution, environmental destruction, and in a lot of ways, unhappiness, but that's the topic of a different video. So what is needed is to first kind of shift our worldview from quantitative growth and expansion and kind of these linear models, especially in economics and finance, to a more sustainable or more qualitative approach. So you can imagine instead of going GDP, which is just about growth and production, to uh, quality of life. Well, how are we using our resources and kind of economic innovation to actually make people happier and improve levels of well-being instead of just manufacture more useless shit? So that's a fundamental shift. Right? And so when we think about uh, these problems of our world, if we can start to make that shift, then it may rethink how our political institutions are set up, how our businesses are set up, how our entire kind of economic systems are set up to, again, shift from the quantitative growth obsessed linear model to more qualitative development, you know, quality of life, wisdom, maturity, values, and ultimately sustainability, which are going to help us to flourish and not end the world. So to summarize what I've shared in this video, this was a little bit of a complex topic to just give us a little lecture here. But again, I have this written resource that goes a lot more in depth on some of these things, uh, which you can check out in the comments below. But it's really the systems use life is shifting to viewing reality, viewing the world, viewing each discipline you're functioning in, viewing the self, and even viewing like the simplest level of biology from machines to these complex systems. Right, that are all about relationships, patterns, context, and noticing how so many of these uh, qualities of a given system emerge at the level of the system. So just like I used the analogy of cutting me into pieces, taking my brain out, putting in a vat, and looking at all of them, you can't really understand reality or understand life or any complex system until you actually see all of the parts together in their certain pattern and the qualities of that uh, thing or of that system emerge at the level of a system. And if we think about that, I think we're gonna be able to think more effectively about uh, happiness, about our understanding of mind and life, our understanding of society, and ultimately our uh, problems today that are facing us as a species. So I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been the Happiness PhD with Jackson Kirchis, and I'll see you next time.